Hello, uh, welcome to uh, Theater Beyond Twitter, a conversation uh, between these two gentlemen here who have actually never met until yesterday, but they have exchanged a considerable conversation on uh, social media, and we'll uh, take it from there. This is the beautiful uh, Mead Center for American Theater. Uh, here in Washington. Welcome to all of you worldwide on live streaming. The, um, uh, the live stream is at L-I-V-E-S-T-R-E-A-M dot com backslash new play. And uh, as soon as this event is over, uh, it can be reiterated. It will be available immediately for anyone who missed it or uh, if you came in, in the middle. My name is Jim O'Quinn. I'm the editor in chief. They're here at the beginning. They can't come in the middle. Well, that's true. <laughs> they can't, but other people might. So, uh, um, I'm the editor in chief of American Theater Magazine. And, uh, and I'll sort of be interceding in the ongoing conversation between these two well informed and uh, very opinionated guys. Uh, I'm sure in this room they really need very little introduction to you, but I've uh, been conscripted, conscripted to do it, so let me introduce How Howard Sherman. Howard and I know each other mainly from looking at each other across crowded dinner luncheon rooms where he represents the American Theater Wing and I represent American Theater. Uh, but uh, in fact, he has had nearly three dec decades of experience at such institutions as the O'Neill Theater Center, Jiva, Good Speed Musicals, Hartford Stage, the Manhattan Theater Club, and Westport Country Playhouse. Now he's a bit more independent as an arts administrator with a particular focus on communications, marketing, and branding. Uh, Peter, uh, whose primary credit uh, has just become being one of the dozen most influential theater critics in the US, uh, as declared by American Theater Magazine last month. I think it was the universe. There may be in the universe, perhaps it was. Uh, but uh, as you know, he, he graduated from uh, the New York Times to becoming the head theater critic of the Washington Post. And uh, I'm sure you all know his work. It was interesting to me. I confess I don't Twitter, but, uh, or tweet. Oh. I know. But uh, I did read that uh, Howard said at one point in this Twitter conversation, I see my role in the theater ecosystem as evangelist, not critic, which I thought was a, an interesting comment. And Peter said at another point, we're journalists, as critics, he said, we're journalists, not members of the theater community. So uh, why don't you guys explain how you came to this Twitter conversation in the first place, not knowing each other, and uh, what the implications are. The short version is I saw him say something on Twitter that I thought was preposterous, and I called him on it. Um, I don't remember the first, and it, it seemed to happen with some regularity. Uh, what's your position? Uh, uh, I guess I'm a bit of a masochist, so this was like theatermatch.com for me. Uh, I loved the fact that Howard, I, I knew Howard from, I never, I didn't know you at all, Howard. And um, I was totally, totally disarmed by the idea that someone would just call me on what he thought was my baloney. And, and I think that, you know, what, I, what has happened to me, I've been, um, I've been tweeting for about five or six months as a result of uh, Ali Houseworth, who was then the communications director of Willie Mammoth, imploring or sort of suggesting to me that this was a world I needed to get involved in. And I found, rather than feeling um, threatened and, uh, uh, and, and overwhelmed by the idea that people had their own opinions and could toss them back at me, I was kind of dazzled by it. And I felt kind of in that equalizing, the exchange that happens on Twitter. And for those of you who don't Twitter, uh, don't use Twitter, uh, it'll be a little bit of a mystery to you what we're talking about. But for those who do, uh, there's a wonderful exchange that goes on. 
in ways that were not happening to me in my position as the theater critic for the Washington Post, you tend to become cocooned in these jobs and you tend to think that you need to retreat from a community in order to cover it to some degree, to, to have the distance to be able to render what you think are uh, informed judgments about the quality of plays. And what happened to me was in the course of doing this and having people come back at me and say to me, you know, what are you talking about? Or, you know, I like this, I don't like that, and you like this and you don't like that. I found that it, it made me less defensive about what I do. It made me feel more receptive to the idea that there were people out there who were feeling frustrated or angry that this seemed like such a monolithic process of, of somebody, you know, shooting you know, lightning bolts down from the, the mountaintop. And at the same time, I, I'm aware that, that mainstream media, that, that the newspapers like the Washington Post are no longer, uh, you know, taking, uh, uh, occupying a soul's uh, peak on the top of the mountaintop, that we're, we're in a process of learning how to share all this. So for that long-winded reason, I was intrigued when, uh, when uh, Howard basically said, you know, you're a jerk about <laughs> this. And, and uh, I wasn't, but I wasn't, I thought it was a good opportunity uh, to, to explore this new dimension through him uh, and, and, and him taking a very strong uh, uh, point of view opposed to some of the things that I think. There's, there's a weird phenomenon. I started out as a publicist, and, and I refer to myself as a recovering press agent. Um, but for some reason, when I started, and I was, I was very young when I started working as a publicist, um, I decided I was never going to kowtow to the press. I was never going to treat them as if what they think is right uh, all the time. Uh, I was there, yes, to help them. I was there to get them to my theater. I was there to get them to... Uh, write articles about what what uh, we were doing, but that I was never going to subsume my own opinion to theirs, regardless of what expertise they may have. So, first online, and then frankly, the conversation here today is I've never been afraid of critics. And the fact is, in most cases, people within a given theater community who are covered by someone, are always have in the back of their mind, I need to curry favor with this individual, and I don't want to challenge this individual. I think there is greater benefit from challenging the assumptions of those who cover theater, whether they are a critic or a reporter, than from simply allowing them to do what they do from an ivory <coughs> tower. So again, the idea that Peter would put himself into a public forum that would potentially allow himself to be attacked um, if people chose to, although, again, if you don't know Twitter, you can just, you can block them and you'll never see it again, but that there was a willingness to engage I thought was really interesting. And the fact is, is we did, there were probably four or five times, purely, I was on, he was on, he said something, I said something, um, back and suddenly we'd go for 30 or 40 minutes um, and on that topic. The only ones. People, well, other and people other, other people would join in. Well. Some of them are here in this room. And in fact, we the last time we got into this, <laughs> hi, first row, um, the, the, the last time we got into this, which was a week ago Friday, um, there were, in addition to the two of us, 22 other people got involved in that conversation. And if there can be, and it was a mix of fans, theater professionals, um, there was a second critic who joined us from Denver who didn't say a lot, but we knew that John Moore was out there because there were a couple of comments from him. And if you can truly have a simultaneous cross-country national conversation about theater on an impromptu basis, you know, that's really powerful. And so while we'll probably bicker about some stuff today, I think this is enormously healthy. Um, for the theater, and I do applaud Peter not only for being on Twitter, but for coming on stage today in the community that he covers and, and really be open about what his place is as somebody who covers theater. 
because I will say fundamentally, because often when I get into these conversations, people end up assuming I don't like critics and I don't like the press. I like anybody who wants to pay more attention to theater and to help theater get more attention. And it is, it is the arts journalists at what ever publication or media outlet they are at who are advocating for coverage. We may not always like what they have to say, but A, they are fighting for their job, they want to be in that paper, you know, they want coverage and they want space to say what, what they want to do, and we want that as much as, as they did. I didn't think the Oprah moment would come so early. But, so, I, 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 no, but I, I, I appreciate that. I do think it is kind of ironic to think, you know, you know, how brave he is to come out to, to talk to people who read his reviews. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it, I mean, to some degree, it's lovely to think that people would come out and would be curious enough to, to want to talk about uh, what reviewing is about and what the critic's function is and what, where this is all going, where we're all going together in the theater. Uh, so, so for me, it's not, you know, I don't feel like I had to do, you know, three weeks of therapy to come and talk to you. Uh, I felt as no, if... that will follow. <laughs> I felt really that it was, you know, it, it was, it's, you know, there aren't these, you know, Twitter, I have to say, has allowed me to see that we need, we all need to be talking about these things, and we have no way to do it. We have very few organs, and, you know, the space is drying up in print media. I mean, that's going bye-bye, you know, that, that's, that, and that's not coming back. Uh, uh, so we need to figure out, all, all of us have to figure out where this is going. How are we going to absorb information about the arts, this, this vital part of our lives that seems to be getting shorter and shorter shrift. And so it's a big conversation. It's not just about two guys who don't share the same point of view on... Well, speaking of uh, um, means of communications, for you in the room, at the end of each row, there is a stack of note cards and pens. And uh, please, at any point in this conversation, uh, write your own questions down. Uh, signed or unsigned, uh, and hand them here to, to Chad. And um, there are people in the room who will, who will collect these, and you can participate um, in that way as well. Can I, I want to I wanna tag on, because it's, a very, it's somewhat a Washington-specific thing, and, and let's get to some red meat for this thing. Um, I don't know how many of you are aware, but um, earlier this week, Michael Kaiser, the president of the Kennedy Center, uh, wrote a piece for the Huffington Post in which he wrote of being scared of all of these voices on the internet that now have the opportunity to, to voice their opinion and suggested that people would be confused by these amateurs and um, that this was leading to the death of legitimate criticism. And I have to say I disagree with him heartily. I would love to sit him down and teach him how to use Twitter. Um, I, would, I would come back from New York on my own dime to do it. Um, because the fact is, what I love is that not just Twitter, Facebook, email, uh, blogging, anything on the internet is creating a democratization of the critical voice. It's a phrase I use a lot, which is that we all have opinions. I can't imagine there's anyone sitting in this room right now who doesn't have an opinion about theater and about the theater that they see. Until the rise of the internet, rough, you know, popularly about 15 years ago, you could share that opinion on the telephone, by letter, or by the people you talked to. Now you have the opportunity to broadcast that. And when everyone is a broadcaster, it doesn't diminish both the incredible reach that Peter has or any critic has in print or on television, but it allows everybody's voice to be heard. I think that's fantastic. And, and I, am, I am concerned when the head of major institutions who are seen as ambassadors to, and, and experts um, are suggesting that there's danger in allowing the audience to have more of a voice. But also, don't you think, I, don't you understand, though, his, his terror a little bit? I mean, if you're the head of a huge organization, mm -hmm that uh, has to sell tons of tickets and you, and you have a, a way you've thought to do that, the idea that you no longer have a voice or a set of voices that you can sort of point to as authorities who can help you sell them in, in quote ads, for example. I mean, if you're starting to, if you need to like refer to what, you know, Sidney Steinberg on, you know, on, uh, 
you know, on Huckabee Street thought of your latest production, and you, you know, and there are a thousand of those people. You know, how does one decide where? where I mean, I'm just saying from his point of view. Don't you think he's got a kind of a gripe, a I worry? Think, I think the fact is, is the world is constantly changing. We have to adapt to it. I remember with great thrill and excitement when Hartford Stage, where I worked for eight years in the 80s and early 90s, got its first fax machine. I mean, that was revolutionary. Everything's revolutionary. I tell a story, and this may be meaningless to you, but I'll tell it very fast. In the mid to late 1980s, um, most organizations, arts organizations, not-for-profits, all were told they had to start getting into desktop publishing because desktop publishing was going to allow them to create um, uh, supporting materials, collateral materials, beyond their big fancy brochure, and they were going to be able to do it for so much less money, and it was going to just save everybody. And the net result was that um, for a period of four or five years was some of the worst graphic design you've ever seen coming out of any of these organizations. People didn't understand that desktop publishing was merely a different set of tools. You still had to be a designer to use it well. That is what social media is. All of these things, whether you use them, or whether you read about them, or whether you only saw the social network. Um, Facebook was founded, I believe, in 2004. Twitter was founded in 2005. Here we are in 2011, and we have TV news and print newspapers telling you what was seen and heard on these and on blogs, which certainly came about a little bit earlier. They are new tools. The message, the strategy, is still the same. You have to adjust to the, to, to the new tools, because if that's where the adoption is going, to, to resist them, well, I, I mean, I'll quote Star Trek, because this is a geeky conversation, resistance is futile. <laughs> <laughs> That's true enough, but you have to acknowledge that the social media, the electronic revolution, has undermined uh, publications and uh, particularly newspapers, and their uh, and arts coverage is suffering in in that way from numbers and and the question of uh, professional authority is not is not one that you can simply dismiss in that. Uh, Television undermined radio. Doesn't mean radio's dead. The movies were supposed to, you know, the television was supposed to undermine the movies. The movies are okay. I, I agree with you that, that, uh, that, that, that um, our traditional modes of journalism are not going away, but they're, they're changing and we don't know where uh, it, it's all going to end up. We don't know where the financing and the professionalism and the, um, the, the uh, actuality is going to, going to be, and we're in a tremendous time of transition. And you know, I have to say, I'm not, I'll, I'll tell you something, you know, I think there's still going to be a need for conversation starters and lightning rods. And I do think that that's why I'm not so threatened by the idea if, you know, I mean, Frank Rich did a piece a couple of weeks ago where he said, you know, arts criticism is basically dead because the, the, tru the truism has come to pass, everyone is a critic. and. Um, but what's still needed is context. You still need some. You still need voices with uh, people who are going to start by saying, you know, this is good or this is bad, and here's why. That's not going to change. You know, you need. You know, basically on Twitter, half of the half of the traffic is about is reacting to what somebody in the media has said. Now that may change as the as the media shrinks, as the as these monolithic media entities uh, dissipate. But for the time being, I'm, and I think if you get out there and you become a, 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 a vo if your voice stays strong in all these on all these platforms, you have a chance to to remain a, a, an important part of the conversation. So maybe that's where it's going to migrate. Maybe you know, maybe you will start reading reviews. You know, you'll, your starting point will be Twitter as opposed to the Washington Post someday. Well, let, let's not endlessly discuss the medium. Let's talk let's, about theater. Let's not. Let's talk about. Let's talk about theater a little bit. I I was interested to see that you two disagreed on the idea of theaters following their stated missions. Um, Peter said that he had no particular interest in a theater's mission as a consumer of art, uh, and you, Howard, said that that was a primary interest to you. What, what, well, uh, what, uh, this, what did you mean? Uh, I hear this, you know, one of the things with that, that, one of the conversations, and I don't know how many people here are part of a, um, a theater, 
How many people here are actually work at a theater in Washington? Um, I mean, and and, uh, and, and and by the way, how many people here, uh, I'm just curious, I know that you can't see this um, if you're watching this from Egypt, but um, uh, how many people here uh, follow Twitter? Oh, more than that. Okay, okay just, just curious. Um, uh, this started with one of many conversations we had, and I think there is a, there is a disconnect between uh, what maybe I think and what some maybe members of the audience care about and what the, the, the people who run nonprofit institutional theaters really care about. And one of those things for me was this idea of mission. I said something like, you know, they were talking about this uh, in the context of the Shakespeare Theater Company doing Fela. And this seemed so out of character for Howard, he basically said, I don't see why, how a, a classical Shakespeare company uh, puts on a contemporary musical about a Nigerian uh, singer activist uh, who pioneered the Afrobeat. And the truth of the matter is, there is no connection, essentially. And I said, who cares? I mean, for me, the idea of a theater having a mission uh, is, is something for the people in the room who created that statement to think to care about. As a theater goer, I care what's on the stage. I care what you show me, and if it's good, I don't really care. I don't think about, hmm, should they be doing this? Because it's not in their mission statement. I just don't think that's an important part of the process. And I have found sometimes that the best things I see are in theater companies that are surprising me by not doing what, they, what they've done all along, what they've said is their mission. And uh, I, I think that we get caught up I think that theaters get caught up. Before we came here today, I read, I went online and I read the mission statements for about 25 theaters. And they, uh, there is not a theater in this country whose mission it is not to inspire, motivate, <laughs> exhort, enthrall people of this country. And to do excellent work. <laughs> and, 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 all and, and to be diverse, and to do new work, and classical work. I mean, it's like it's everybody's mission. So it seemed to me a silly thing to get hung up on. I don't think... I don't think audiences particularly care what theater they're, they're in when they're seeing something great. I think that the, I think audiences hunger for you in the theater to do great things for us, and and we'll come. You know, we'll come no matter where it is. If 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 we can find out about it, and and you don't charge us an arm and a leg every time we do it, that's what's important. I mean, to me, a, an important mission statement would be. We're only charging fifteen dollars. <laughs> That's a mission statement to me. You know, a mission statement to me is not we're going to delight you and make you happy, and you're going to have a better life because you came to our theater. I, everybody thinks that. Tell them why it's wrong. What? Well, <laughs> I believe our moderator has an opinion, <laughs> and I may not actually jive with, with exactly what Jim was doing. With, feels about this. I, I was looking at it from a couple of perspectives, and by no means do I wish to to, to beat up on. Um, on the Shakespeare Theater, um, they're a great company. I was I was experiencing cognitive dissonance. It just seemed confusing to me. And I don't attend a lot of theater here in DC, but I'm certainly aware of what goes on. What surprised me was not simply that the show was being done, but that it was the launch of a commercial tour. And at the time that we had this conversation, one of the responses um, in the conversation, I don't know if it was Peter or, or someone else who joined us, said, well, it's not a show that could play commercially. And the irony was, um, very shortly thereafter, it was announced that it would be returning to Washington as a commercial tour. So, and, in, and, and Fella has done that, it did that in London as well. It played at the National, it had its limited run, and then it came back as, as a commercial run. To me, the issue of mission is not the generic statement, and yes, there's too many, and part of the reason they become generic is because organizations don't want to have to say, we're about this, because then that's there's something they're measured by. But I do think, especially in communities where there's a multiplicity of theaters, having people have some understanding of what you are there to do, and especially if you have in your name an explanation of the kind of work you do. It's not that it matters that night, but it matters over the, the lifespan of a company. The greatest thing that should be happening 
for institutional theaters, and I'm not talking about commercial theater at all or touring houses, is that work is viewed in the context of a larger body of work. Commercial theater is when you go, you see a show, and you like it or you don't like it. These institutions were founded in order to provide homes for artists with different, you know, different focuses, different priorities. They could be very general in what they do. The greatest thing that I think critics can do and journalists can do is not treat every artistic event at institutional theaters as discrete events, but understand them in the context of the institution. And in order to do that, there needs to be some understanding of what the organization's goals are. And so it's not about here's etched above, you know, neither rain nor snow nor sleet. I mean, the post office, you know, is, is, is burdened by that being etched above its doors in New York City. I'm not even kidding. Um, so it's not about a big declaration, but it is about understanding why the company is there, what the company wants to do, and at the moment I'm not sucking up, but I'll say, Molly has set out at this institution a very clear definition of what she wants it to be. And certainly the, the new play effort as part of that is very, very clear. How ARENA fits in the ecosystem of theater here in Washington in relation to the Shakespeare Theater, in relation to Woolly Mammoth, in relation to Theater J, and I'm just trying to prove that I do know what's going on in, in these things. Um, I gave him a primer. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, understanding what each of those institutions is for and about fundamentally can matter in press, it can matter you know, to the press, the press who communicate to audiences, how it affects your marketing, how it affects your fundraising, I think that that filters through. It's not about the words, but in the absence of defining an organization, the organization defining itself, the audience will define the organization as they see fit, and they don't always understand what the organization is there to do. Um, you know, uh, interestingly, Arena Stage uh, said they were, the, uh, they were the theater, American voices, American uh, uh, plays, and I saw this terrific production of uh, Moliere here. Uh, I saw a very interesting interpretation of Brecht's A Man's a Man here. Uh, you know, I mean, and sorry, Molly, I'm not, uh, I'm just saying that, that, that <laughs> I'm just saying that, you know, I don't know that it didn't cause any, you know, it doesn't, I don't think anybody, you know, there weren't picketing uh, outside the theater. And, and also, I don't, you know, I, I, I do think, I mean, not that we can get caught up in this, but of course you want to follow, you want to track the progress of a theater. It's the most exciting thing for me is watching the growth of a, of a small company in this town become a more firmer part of the soil here. And that has happened several times, whether it was Synetic Theater, um, uh, which is a, a very movement-based and very quirky company, or if it's a company like Forum, which is doing interesting plays out in Silver Spring now. I mean, there are, there are things that happen and you want to watch, the, you want to chart the growth of those, those places. But I'm not so sure that, I'm not so sure that as members of the community, anyone is really um, following, you know, is trying to figure out what larger thing this company is trying to say. But this is, you know, I, I think we should, I don't know if we want to go, you know, I'm not so sure. I, mean, I think that's not, I, I, I think we're, but that's just me sort of trying to understand, you know, understand it on, a, on the plateau of what are people going to like going to as opposed to, you know, I think whatever that larger uh, continuum well, is. If you just allow me, I think, you know, a mission about new plays, there's risk in new plays. And whether it's Arena, whether it's Willie Ware, whether it's any company that, that does a great deal of new work, the idea that people come to understand that new work, not risky in the sense of, oh, it's dangerous and people are going to be shocked. Risky in the fact that it's an inexact process. And sometimes everything comes together and sometimes it doesn't. And believing in the idea that there must be new plays yes. and that a theater does, you know, has that mission should allow that theater the freedom 
to not succeed every time and not be ultimately <coughs> beaten up or castigated or lose funding for doing so. I think that's true. I, I have no. I, I think that that's an easier. I think that's easy. That's easy to say if you're not laying out ninety-five bucks to see the play. I mean, in other words, I think there is a component. You're, you're, you're compact with the theater, and I, I've seen many people get alienated from, 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 from this new play idea when they, when they feel like they've, they're not seeing something that was ready to be seen. But let me ask you something about money, because this comes up, which is, you don't pay for your theater tickets. Ah. Correct. I rarely pay for my theater tickets, because right. I've managed to hustle good jobs that, that give me access. When you're a critic, right? Why should the cost of the ticket matter? It, it doesn't. I mean, that's not... But you bring it up. Well, because it's, I'm saying that I think for, I, it's easy for me to say, but I don't think it's easy for... If you're somebody who's trying to support what's going on in a community and has to lay out this money, I, you know, it, it doesn't... I, I can't let a company off the hook just because they're trying new things. It, 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 yes, you've got to give some breadth of, 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 of understanding to the fact that you want God, you want new things to happen. But what I'm saying is, yes, I, I think actually it would be a healthier thing, uh, you know, um, just, you know, the camera's going to record it. I think it would be healthier if we did pay for every ticket. I think it would be healthier, it would, it would be healthier for me, you know, maybe for my, you know, sense of, you know, uh, of, of distance from what I'm seeing, but it wouldn't be healthier for the theater, I mean, for the Washington Post. I mean, it would be very expensive. And part, and part, and frankly, the problem is not so much, you know, we would, we would just make more choices about what we saw, I think, because we wouldn't be able to afford to see everything, and the complaint would be from the theater companies, you're not coming to see everything, please take these tickets. You know what I mean? So it's a, it's a, a cycle we're on. But what, I, I, what I'm trying to say is, I, do, I don't uh, try to evaluate uh, a, a, a play based on how much they're charging. Very often, I don't even know. But what I am saying is that I sympathize with people who want to go to see a lot of things and have to sacrifice. I mean, it's a big sacrifice in some cases the amounts of money that it costs to see plays uh, in Washington. And it's probably a reason that more, you know, young, I, I taught for several years at GW. Um, it's, it's, it's the main reason that kids didn't go to see more theater. Uh, they were I don't just, think it's a unique to Washington. No, no, no of course is, not. Theater is, is, is a labor-intensive business that gets expensive as the world gets more expensive. So, but, but I do, I always wonder with critics because there, there always seems to, be this point in the conversation where critics, first of all, just want to talk about, um, you know, they write what they feel. They're writing for themselves. They're writing their opinion. And then they start talking about sort of this populist idea of is it, is it worth it and should people put out the money and everything else. And, and I feel like either you're a consumer reporter, in which case you should report and say you'll have a great time even if you hate it, or leave money out of the equation and just say what your opinion is and people can make their own decisions well, whether they like you or not. That's a perfect world that doesn't exist. You're asked to be both. You're asked to be both a consumer reporter in a sense and an artistic sort of evaluator. You can't, you, the, the two just uh, meld them when you're a, a, a reviewer at a daily newspaper. If you, if you ignore one or the other, you're, you're abdicating your responsibility. It, it doesn't always you know, fit. You know, it's a lot different when you're evaluating a new play at Studio Theater uh, by a British playwright who's come, who they're tr and they're trying something new than if you're doing uh, you know, the return visit of Jersey Boys. I mean, obviously, you know, those, those, are, those are apples and oranges. You're going to clearly you understand that there's a, um, that there's a, 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 pure, a pure commercial uh, um, uh, intent in one than the other. But that doesn't mean you send people to the to the to uh, the Terrell McCraney play just because it's it may be a itself a more uh, idealistic altruistic experience. Um, they're still going to have to pay fifty bucks to see that that show, and you so you balance these things. You know that's what you have to do. I mean that's what the good critics do. I think I I, I don't feel good when people feel betrayed by a review and they feel like they you know they're overly it's overly something that's overly praised. They go and they feel as if they've been had. And your credibility suffers as a result, and the cult, the credibility of reviewers suffers as a result, um, and it's why people turn to you know uh, other forms, the democratization of opinion, and which is great. All right, which Jim's got great. little cards. Let's got some uh, little cards here. People, someone wants to know, Peter, that have have members of a 
theater company or um, people in the theater written to you to argue or agree? Do they do this regularly or is this a whole new phenomenon? That's a great question. Uh, you know, it, no, they don't. I get very little, uh, res I get very little uh, of either, you know, thank you or screw you. I mean, I get very, <laughs> I don't hear much. I'll tell you what happened to me. Uh, I'll tell you an interesting, about two years ago, a very fine Washington actress uh, friended me on Facebook. And I, I say yes to everybody. I can, anybody who friends me, I friend them. At first, it was like a weird, you know, like, uh, it felt slightly like uh, transgressive, like I was, you know, I was almost like, you know, cheating on my wife or something. You know, you're thinking yes to people. Who were you uh, friending? Well, <laughs> I mean, I mean, it was like, it's a, it's a community that of people, you know, a theater community that I was sort of trained at the New York Times to be, uh, to stay away from. So I started accepting, and, and I, one of these people was a, an exceptional actress whose work I praised to the hills, and I, this person was in a show in a small theater, and I didn't like the play, after having loved, you know, five or six plays, and she posted on her, on, on her, on her page, um, and I even praised her in this production, um, let's start a campaign to get rid of this, of Peter Marks. He's a, uh, oh, he's a no. wart on, you know, the theater community. I mean, the ass of the theater community, or something like that. And I was crushed. I mean, yeah, well, I, <laughs> I mean, I, well, you know, I'm a person. I mean, right? I'm not a human being. And, and it was like, but it, it felt like such an unfair, I wasn't saying, you know, banish this company from the face of the earth. I was saying, eh, I didn't like this one. <laughs> and the re response was so over the top, but, but it, what it complicated next was, I now was engaged in a very confused relationship with this person. <laughs> you know, it was now very like hostile. I liked her and she didn't like me. So what did that do to the next time I was gonna see her on the stage? And I felt like, do I now, am I compromised? Can I not? And you know, I didn't review the next thing she was in. Mm -hmm. Because I felt suddenly like it had changed the, tr the, the contract that I was gonna somehow, if I liked her, it was because I was now trying to curry favor with her. And if I didn't like her, I was taking revenge on her. So it, it's not just, you know, the, the weirdness doesn't happen just because people uh, in theater companies are worried that I'm going to get angry at them. But I will say Twitter is, you know, again, you know, my Oprah moment uh, is that Twitter it sort of helped me understand that, you know, these people have emotional responses to what you write. And they have a very, qu people on the spur of the moment say things they don't necessarily think in the long run. Um, and I'm happy to tell you I'm now the godparent of her child. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> but but I, I got over it. And I, and I think I would have reacted very differently now. How, and, and, and I think... You know, maybe I'm inviting, you know, Pandora's box to open for me, but I would, I would love to hear more. The other thing you've got to realize, Jim, is a lot of the theater world is very ambivalent about conferring power on me. They don't want to, there are many people in the theater world and other critics, they don't, some people in, 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 a, in the arts um, don't acknowledge or recognize the, um, the, 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 uh, the validity of a critic. And so they, they push it aside. So it, you know, for them to respond to me is to give me what they would see, some would see as equal, as, as making me their equal. And, and some don't even read them. I think that's a healthy thing, frankly. I think, I think that's healthy. But, but you're talking about individual artists because institutions, frankly, are oh, on oh, an oh, endless yeah. cycle mm -hmm. of, of perpetuating the authority of critics. They're called quote ads. And, you know, they will, they will sometimes slice and dice what you say artfully with the use of the ellipsis to, <laughs> to be able to say, you know, that the Washington Post, frankly, they care less whether it's you or anybody else. I they want to be able to say that that paper has conferred authority. Right. And, I mean, I have been having this, these discussions for 25 years, and nobody is willing to break the cycle because unless every theater in a city absolutely said, we will not quote reviews in our ads, 
no one would be no, able to. It's, like, it's yeah. like the airlines with pricing. The moment one moves, mm -hmm. the other will do it. So unless it was a complete cessation, the theaters, any arts organization that constantly wants to decry critics are the first people out of the box to put them on their brochures, put them in their ads, put them in their grant applications, so on and so forth. Yes. So, well, um, but well, uh, people uh, want to know what's left of the place and function of critics when you can get immediate reactions from um, social networks. But I think not about sort critics, of, yeah. Know, yeah, yeah, enough about that. That's, that's enough. Uh, let's talk about <laughs> money. Let's talk about money. The people want to know. <laughs> <laughs> Given the expansion of theaters in DC with uh, you know, the arena and signatures, new place and so forth, how, is there, how are all these theaters, this is Rocco Landisman's question, how are all these theaters going to survive uh, in a time of funding cuts and reduced money? Is it going to happen? Is, it, is, is that, are we over, overloaded in that sense? I think that remains to be seen. You know, uh, we, should, we should make reverence. Um, uh, at an event, uh, a public, uh, a large convening here at Arena back in January of this year, Rocco Landisman made a statement in which he, Rocco, who's the chairman of the NEA, uh, made a statement to the effect that um, there was an overabundance of theaters and that probably it was, that maybe some shouldn't be there anymore. I think every business that enters the marketplace and theaters, although they are artistic institutions, they are also businesses, enter a Darwinian world. We may not like it. But, but it exists. I think, ironically, I go back to my statement about mission. I think if, and, and even to Peter's statement, it's simply about quality. I think if, if the theaters, if any arts organization can make the case for themselves, can find an audience within the uh, proportion that they need to to sustain themselves, if they don't overreach, if they are realistic in their approach. Um, it's not to say that some may not succeed overall, but if they're, if they're operating from a rational position and not if you build it they will come, then you will simply find what can be done. Peter made a comment, and I think it was a good one on Twitter, that if after five years a theater company's primarily, primary marketing strategy is to get good reviews, they should probably go out of business, may well be true, unless they get such consistently good reviews that it's enough to drive the audience. I didn't say go out of business. I said they should maybe start looking at another career. <laughs> <laughs> well, and there's a difference. I, I don't think, okay. I'm not saying they have to leave. I'm saying that okay. at, at a certain point, you, you, you have to, you have to have um, established a relationship with people who want to see your things, uh, yeah. other than waiting to see if a reviewer liked what you did. Well, this person yeah, it has to, to know, it has to be a more intense. Connection. This person wants to know: Shouldn't theaters, when developing their visions, ask audiences what they want to see? No, no. <laughs> no. Okay. I mean, we we can't like go into an isolation booth and see why. But I'll give you my answer, which is because. Audiences can only tell you things they've seen before that they want, enjoyed and want to see again. People don't know what may be coming. They don't, even if it's a play, even if it's a revival, they don't know what the approach is going to be. They may not have liked the last production. It may have simply been bad. If it's a new play, it's impossible for people to ask for specific new plays. I mean, I guess some creative person could say, I'd really like to see a play about, you know, a boy and his dog. Do you have any plays about boys and dogs? <laughs> but there are, this is, this has happened more, I'm not aware of it in um, companies that primarily do plays. I do know that some of the larger civic light opera companies um, have done this from time to time. Companies that are primarily mining the back catalog of, um, of the American musical theater. And the fact is, is what they want to see is a show they liked the last time. You can't be an artistic institution you can't be trying to, to work and forward creative arts 
and do it based on people telling you what they liked before. That's too cynical. I don't think that people want to see necessarily what they saw before. I think people want. I just want to say, it's not cynicism. It's actually borne out by what some of these companies have gotten as results, which is why they mostly stopped doing. It. Right. Well, when you ask, what are you supposed to say? I mean, it's like you know. I mean, it's, we're not patients telling the doctor what you know. Our neck hurts. Fix my neck. You know. I mean, it's not. It's not that relationship. The, what we want our arts, le our artistic leaders to do is show us yep. where what we wanted. You know. I mean, they tell us what we wanted. That's what they do. And we didn't know we wanted it until we see it. You know, you didn't know that this, you know, I didn't know that Next to Normal was going to be the most important musical in my life for the last three years. I mean, I, you know, until I saw it, I could not possibly have dreamed it up. And certainly, you know, critics, I don't think, should be prescribers either. They should not be depended on to tell you what you should be doing. I mean, I think they're, they're, that's not what they do well. They're, they're, it's a much more reactive profession. But I want, I want artistic <laughs> leaders, and it's one of the things that, I want them to think really, imagine it's outside the box, Do they, all those cliches. I want them to take me to those places. You know, that's what, that's what the leadership is. Yeah. And, well, just, I mean, Next to Normal is a great example. I saw Next to Normal when it first played at second stage. And I will say that at that point in the piece's development, um, because of issues within my extended family, uh, and material that was in the show that I don't think even made it here to Washington, uh, I almost left an intermission. Not because I was bored, I was offended and upset by the treatment of, of how mental illness was being portrayed. And if someone at that point had said, do you want to go see Next to Normal again? Or, you know, should we put in our season? My response would be, would have been, if they don't fix this, this, and this, no, I, I can't recommend it. So there is that thing of you can respond to what you know. When next to normal, I don't know exactly what shape it was in here, but certainly by the time it came back and was on Broadway, all of the material that I found offensive and insensitive to the issues it was dealing with were gone. I also, I mean, the same thing was true actually of Avenue Q, which, which was a show I had some uh, tangential involvement in, um, which did cut a song which used to be the act one closer, which I found so offensive. It was being done in workshop at the theater I ran, and I found so offensive I used to leave the theater every night because I couldn't bear to watch it. And when I saw it at the Vineyard Theater in New York when they were first off Broadway, I, I did something you know completely preposterous, which was at, after intermission and the song wasn't there, I went up to one of the authors and I said, oh, thank you for cutting that. <laughs> <laughs> I realize that's somewhat of a tangent, but. Uh, <laughs> well, that's good. Uh, you also spoke uh, disparagingly, um, uh, which at one some of point, uh, oh. Peter did, about celebrity casting. What uh, uh, do you still feel that that's a, a bad thing in general? Or well, we don't. Uh, you know, it, it's not a Washington. Um, it's not really a Washington phenomenon. Uh, it's that's really a New York uh, um, issue, and I I took that well, issue off. L.A. Chicago. Uh, yeah. I, well, I mean, I, I'm trying to, you know, I mean, we, you know, it's the, the, one of the great things about this town is that really fine actors work all year round. I mean, I'm sure they would like to work more than they do, but they, they, they have, what I discovered when I came here, which was extraordinary um, from another large city with a lot of theater, uh, was that the actors here really developed stage muscles. They really felt uh, on the stage, that's where they lived. Uh, and in many other places, New York included, they are occasional visitors. Not always, but in large measure, this has been, this, this, that habit, that trend has been reinforced in places like New York because the casting now is so often about uh, celebrity. The reason I got freaked out, and I went out, I freaked out on Twitter, and then I heard from the fans, uh, was uh, one of the Jonas Brothers, which one? I Does can't tell matter. them apart. Yeah. Nick, thank you. Joe, Bob, whatever one was. Which what? Zeppo <laughs> uh, has been cast to replace Daniel Radcliffe as the, as uh, Pierpod Finch as the lead in How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying, and it just. I just said, you know, let's all pack up and leave because this is not, I didn't, you know, I don't really think that, you know, uh, that, that the theater is served by just bringing in brand name actors who have no real connection to what we experience in the theater and making them 
the, you know, the, the, the focal points of a production. Now, Daniel Radcliffe is a lovely young man. I think he's a really great Harry Potter. He, uh, he is a terrible, I think, song and dance man with no charisma on the stage. He's just, he excites you know, his audience, and therefore this show is selling out. I mean, it's, it's the, one of the biggest hits on Broadway, and the last time it was on Broadway with Matthew Broderick, it was a nervous hit. It was not a big hit. Right. So, I mean, I understand the power of celebrity completely. I understand what they can think. But I don't think they do anything for the theater. I think they do something for themselves, and, they, and obviously the other actors who are working around them for that show. Yes, and they fulfill the producer's pockets, but there's no payback. There's no, there's no ongoing a return. It does not create new theater goers. I, I just don't believe it does. I think it creates more for their fan club to sort of, you know, to revel in. And I, I just disagree with you. I think there are plenty of people who may go see How to Succeed, and I am very carefully, you'll notice, not going to voice my opinion of Daniel Radcliffe, who's a nice guy. Um, and has bodyguards. Um, <laughs> Um, no, but in all seriousness, yes, I believe there are probably plenty of people who are going to see this production of How to Stick a Seed in Business without really trying because Harry Potter's in. That's all they know, and they're desperate to be in the same room as him. If, let's say, 1% of the 12,000 people who see that show mm -hmm. a week are people who've not been to theater before and are willing to give it another chance. And to hear Frank Lesser's score, which is a great, I mean, it's a, it's a wonderful show. <laughs> you know, if it gives those people a chance to hear it and possibly engage them, I think that's okay. No, I'm sorry, I'm making you know, faces. And what's really <laughs> interesting. I'm mugging. Well, you're mugging. Sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm doing my best to take you seriously. <laughs> I'm listening, I'm listening. I do think that people come to theater for all different reasons. And sometimes it's celebrity, sometimes it's because their class takes them. But the fact is, is if we don't keep getting people excited, and yes, we can sit here as Caucasian men of a certain generation and ethnic background and be snooty because we may have always had this as part of our life. I was not, I was not taking the theater. I only really started going to the theater when I was old enough to take myself. It was not part of my family's experience. Um, but whatever gets somebody in, not just the first time, but I hope the second and third time, has the potential of building an audience for the future. And the likelihood, I mean, I, I forget the age range of when the Harry Potter books started and when the movies started, but if there's a generation of people who are aware of how to succeed in business without really trying, and some small percentage of them decides to go back because they had a good time and they hear, oh, he wrote another show called Guys and Dolls? <laughs> maybe, just maybe, that moves things forward. And, and we can sit with our critical eyes, and, and again, I believe everybody's a critic, and say what we want about the performances of everyone in that show, or the prior show, or what we know from the 1962 cast album, but I don't think there's anything wrong with the conferred legitimization of theater that celebrity can bring. I am troubled, and I share with you the idea that people are cast purely because they are celebrities and don't actually necessarily have the ability to perform the role, and that's a judgment call. I think as often as not, when people do it the first time, some we find are brilliant, and some we find may never do it again, some overreach. But the fact is, in a media world where there is so much battle for attention, and in which live theater is increasingly marginalized, and has been increasingly marginalized, over decades, anything that reminds people theater is there Time. is good. Yeah. No, uh, I, I, I was going to say 
that I, there is a... One Peter, one, you one, touched my thigh, and now you've touched my arm. I, I told you, you! I have never had this much physical contact with a critic in my life. <laughs> and, and may I say, it makes me uncomfortable. <laughs> well, uh, then, then I'm gonna, then I'm gonna sort of like sit in your lap next, because I, uh, you should be uncomfortable. Um, I, I was just gonna say that play, I, I think that once upon a time, Plays were stars, and playwrights were stars, and you went to Broadway or wherever you went to see an Arthur Miller play, or a Tennessee Williams play, or an Edgar Albee play, or uh, Edward. But go ahead. But I say, uh, sorry, I'm thinking of Edgar Dobie. Sorry, <laughs> Edward Albee. I love his work. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, or a Sam Shepard. But now you go to see Chris Rock in a play on Broadway called The Motherfucker, which actually is a good play. But you don't know that you know that Stephen Adley Gerges is the playwright. I mean, it's it's not those things don't happen anymore. It's because we are we're obsessed with seeing some with our curiosity about the person who's in the part. Now, I mean, there weren't even stars on Broadway, but they were Broadway minted stars. They were people who became stars because they worked on Broadway, and they became famous and they had a following. That doesn't happen anymore. That's some, a, one one of our uh, audience members suspects that. You, as a critic, don't like celebrity casting because it makes shows critic proof. No, I don't care. I, listen, I, I, you know that's a that's a that's a uh, that's mythology that that critics you know care about uh, um, whether or not want to have the power to stop audience. You can't. St I can't make people go to a play they don't want to go to any more than I can stop them from going to one they want to see. There's just no. That's a. I can help. I can I can I can contribute to the uh, zeitgeist. I can I can help with the word of mouth um, when I like something, but the idea that um, I, that I'm offended by people going to see hey you want to see crap you go see crap I can't I can't stop you. I'm just saying I mean I'm not saying that you know that, that's that's the you know that's that's what happens sometimes in my opinion. Crap is in the eye of the beholder. You know. uh, exactly, and then, that, but that's my, you know, what, what other perspective do I have but my own? I mean, like everybody else. And I think that some of the things that have, you know, lasted a long, long time are not very good. Um, Aside okay. from casting a Jonas boy, um, what ideas do you have to encourage more theater experiences for students? Well, I took, stu I, you know, I taught, at G as I said, I've taught reviewing for like six or seven years at GW, and I watched uh, kids in an honors program who had almost no experience with theater turn into theater kids. And what, you know what, the, the answer is mentoring, and it's not one time. Mm -hmm. It's lowering the, the fear, the threshold of terror that young people feel uh, uh, it, it, that somehow going to the theater is not their place. And if they go six or seven times in a concentrated amount of time and they find out, you know, that, that the largely older audience isn't going to bite their heads off, that they're actually happy to see younger people there, that, um, that it's not incomprehensible, that there are many a a aspects of life being touched on that they had no idea could actually be represented on a stage, those things make kids excited. I, I think it's more important than the price, actually. I think it's making them understand that these rooms are for them. And, and that takes someone showing them and talk and translating sometimes for them. Telling them, you know, that it's okay to not understand, that, you know, that, that, and that, that these things are not perfect, and all those things. It's, it's lowering the confusion level. For very, very bright kids, too. I mean, I, I, across the spectrum of intelligence, from, you know, from, it has nothing to do with, it's just, a, it's, an, it's a lack of a, you know, of a familiarity. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it is access, whatever, you know, in, in all of the, in the different ways. The idea that it shouldn't be treated as a rarefied experience. I mean, it's amazing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to my thing about mission. You know, when theater once upon a time was treated as a formal and, um, you know, it was, it had to be an event. And you had to dress up. And opening nights had tuxedos, and you needed to go in a jacket and tie. And you know, every so often, I see people bemoaning um, the way people go dressed to the theater. And my answer, in my response, is as long as they're going, I really don't care how they're dressed. Um, demystifying it, stripping away the idea that going to the theater. I mean, I don't. I'm not a big opera goer. I'm not. A, I'm not a big ballet goer. Um, I have a sense of those, uh, frankly, that I retain. Even I go occasionally, but it's not my meat. And I think of those as snootier for some reason. 
if in the spectrum of entertainment, I want to see theater the equivalent, and people don't go to this so much, but going to the movie. It should be, the access should be as easy as possible, and the experience should be as friendly as possible. That, you know, it is, it is a communal experience, that it's good to respond. One of the things that's always struck me um, at theaters I've been at, you know, teachers prepare kids to go to the theater, and one of the things, they, they're just hammered about how they should behave and what's proper and what's right. And sometimes kids are scared to the point that they don't think they can laugh or applaud or respond. And no, you know, you shouldn't, it, you're not watching, you know, a video at home, so you shouldn't be talking loudly while the show is going on or we can do the cell phone conversation, but it's boring. But the fact of the matter is, they need to know that it, 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 you are able to express yourself. And because I've, I've found, you know, acting companies, you know, there are a lot of jokes. People will say, oh, it's our 11 a.m. matinee today. And, uh, uh, uh. But, you know, the bottom line is the actors understand that they will get, quote unquote, inappropriate responses. And they can roll with that. So I wish that the teachers were instilling, spending more time preparing them if they need a knowledge base for the play, you know, with that, then saying, now don't you dare, Absolutely. you know, do this or do that. And I'll say something else about teaching, you know, about, about what will get young people to theater. I mean, in, and I'm going to use Shakespeare because I know people, you know, who are 50 years old who say, I've always hated Shakespeare, I've always hated Shakespeare. I think the best thing that could happen is that before you have to study Shakespeare, you see it. Mm -hmm. Um, preferably good Shakespeare, um, because what I've found is, is people get so frightened at, at a young age by the language, and that as long as you're seeing a production of Shakespeare where the intention is clear and where indeed the actors know what the words mean, the audience will have no problem with it. And as soon as you take that barrier away, then they can read it, but, but the text scares them. Sometimes teachers that don't really understand Shakespeare and are looking at it totally as a literary experience. And that's where, you know, in terms of general curriculum, Shakespeare is still taught. Do you, and do you, do you think that there's, you know, since we're, this is called Theater Beyond Twitter, is there a social media part to this? Is there something that should be used that theaters aren't doing to make this point to drive home these points for young people. I mean, I think a lot of theaters are doing that. I think, I think there are attempts, it's not specifically social media, I think there's a lot online. You know, there's, there's now um, a, a line of comic books, most of you probably are not familiar with, with what's called manga, which is a particular type of graphic novel coming out of Japan, and there's now manga Shakespeare books, and it's really the Shakespeare words, mm -hmm. but it's drawn and, and put out in the style of Shakespeare. I thought there was a very funny thing uh, on Twitter running at one point where everybody was being asked, you know, come up with um, six word descriptions of Shakespeare plays. And, um, you know, I came up with for Lear, God, I've got to try to get it right now because it was six <coughs> words, but it was something to the event of uh, family, poor family planning leads to tragedy. King there. But you know, if you can laugh about it, estate if you can plan. If estate planning. You know, estate planning, that's what it was. Um, but again, demystification. What we are doing here, and I also would say, there are, you know, if kids can participate in some way in theater, the act of making theater is fundamentally identical at every single level that it happens. The only thing that's different is money how much you have to put it on. But it's still about people going into a room, learning a script, and putting it on in front of other people. So getting kids the opportunity to try that for themselves, they may like it or not like it, but they'll understand it better, I think is, is hugely important. All right. Um, somebody wants to know, what was the original debate that inspired you to, what was it that you thought was preposterous about I don't remember what the first. I, I know the Nick Jonas debate was early, but 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 I don't I don't remember. So um, and it's 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 not. I mean I don't even think it's really the point. It's um, 
again, it's just the idea that, that, that there's the access. Um, I mean, I'm opinionated. I've, I've very, can, very carefully said I won't, you know, I, w I am not a critic. And even though I've built some following on Twitter, you can't look through my tweets and find out what I think of shows. I'm more interested in the idea of theater, and it goes back to that thing you quoted about, about being a theater evangelist. I'm not there to sell tickets to any individual production. And at the wing, that was not my goal. And in my post-wing career, I don't want that to be my goal. I want to just keep figuring out ways both to offer opportunities for people to understand more about theater, to demystify it, which is part of this. If demystifying, understanding who and what critics are and the position that they operate from, that's that's all to the good. I, you know, it's funny because the other thing I was say is I didn't really even think that we were what we were doing was that heated, but it it, it was so obviously a lot of people found it so shocking oh, yeah. that that you could uh, challenge a critic's online and they would respond. I mean, that to me is, I, I don't even, I don't know how to deal with that. I don't even know what to, to make of that. that. That people, I guess that we've become that, we believe that there's such a wall between people writing about plays and people being in plays. Well, that's what we were taught in J school, you know. I guess, you know, but it just seems, you know, like... Yeah, well, there was an interesting, we, we got a good conversation about community and whether you consider yourself part of the theater community and you you said no, you're not part of the community, but you were more comfortable with being part of the theatrical ecosystem. Well, somebody so, used that word, <coughs> right? But you said you liked that word, and despite it, you know, feeling like a terrarium and <laughs> what level you're on, um, you know, okay, that's that's legit. I think as the world becomes ever more accessible and these these different media allow people to meet together, I wonder whether critics will be able to hold themselves apart in the same way that they have, or whether they will be forced into a familiarity. I mean, there was always the belief, you know, from the theater side of things that, you know, if they understood these are real people whose lives they're affecting, maybe they wouldn't be so mean. And you know something? I kind of think that's true. But what's happening now is because the critics are holding themselves up to actually hearing criticism, they will be forced to re-examine what it means to be publicly adjudicated. Yeah, and I, I don't even think that, you know, frankly, uh, I don't think the critics that, that cover theater are really that mean. I mean, I really don't. I mean, there are some mean people who, don't, who you know, have a... Uh, 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 who seem to have that's their sort of function to be kind of uh, uh, vicious or to be to, to to really have poison. I think it's a fairly, frankly, um, fairly gentle uh, 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 craft at this point in in the evolution of, of criticism. And I do think also though that if you're gonna if we're gonna survive, we have to we have to be engaging at every. You have to be talking to people who want to talk to you. Uh, not every person, because some people are just you know. You can't talk to them. They're just, they get really worked up and say very mean things. But, I mean, anybody else is, you know, is, I think there's, it's a wonderful possibility and it opens up all kinds of I would like to posit that the very active performance is, is theater is a forum and it's a place for the sharing of ideas and that the discourse that comes after theater is an essential part of the performance. And in that way, uh, I don't think really you can deny that you're part of the theater community. It's really all part of a, an arc. You're part of the act of theater because the conversation that comes after performance. I think you're a part of a community if the community agrees you're part of the community. I don't think that the, I don't think you get a consensus from people in the theater community that critics are part of the community. Yeah. I think that some would see it that way and some don't. And in journalism, I, listen, I was a reporter before I was a critic. Uh, my, I think of myself as part of a journalistic community, not really part of it. And I love the theater, you know what I mean? I, you know, I, but I chose a different career. I chose not to be in the theater. I mean, it's a matter, matter of semantics, but it really goes to the, you know, the function of how you do your job. Mm -hmm. How do awards and reviews affect how work, whether it's deserving or undeserving, is encouraged in New York? and then proceeds to go to D.C. and spread out across the country and other cities. You want to go first? 
how do awards affect uh, whether the work gets done? Yeah. Well, actually, the, the, the Pulitzer Prize winner from last year was done in, New, in, in Washington concurrently with New York. Uh, I was on the Pulitzer jury, actually, that picked Clybourne Park as the Pulitzer winner. Anybody see Clybourne Park? Uh, <laughs> uh, I thought it was an extraordinary play. And uh, I think that a play that is a serious Pulitzer contender this year started in Washington and went, is going to is in New York now, and it's Mike Daisy's uh, monologue. Mm -hmm. It's not a conventional play, but I think it's, I think it's absolutely warrants serious Pulitzer consideration. Um, and what I'm saying is, I, you know, I mean, you know, that's, I think it's radiating out more and more. It, it, it you know, all the, I think nine of the ten Pulitzer winners from the last ten years all started in regional theaters or institutional yes. theaters of some yes. kind. So, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's not that I don't think theaters here are looking for award winners necessarily. I think they're generating more of the award, the, the things that are worthy of awards, um, except on the obviously the big musical front. That's the one area that I don't think is happening anywhere but in New York, because, or uh, on the road to New York, because... Uh, it's interesting to note in the case of Clyburn Park, the New York production sort of came and went uh, before the DC production, and then now that the Pulitzer Prize... Well, they were concurrent. To, yeah, they, it opened yeah. in New York and it opened in Washington. They, they overlapped. And, and it made a bigger stir in Washington right. than it did in New York. Yes. And now... Uh, it's going to Broadway, the, the, the play is being done in eight major theaters across the country, huge. Uh, and it's important to point out that Next to Normal had its, you know, it, its, its most important stop was at Arena Stage on the way to its own Pulitzer Prize. It really wouldn't have gotten there without that stop. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's, you know, it, it, it really is that, um, so I don't really think, I don't think that Washington Theater really cares that much about the awards that happen elsewhere. You know, like Tony Awards and stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think it really has that much meaning. Maybe I'm um, I can't even remember what won the Tony Award. What play won the Tony Award last year? War Horse. Oh, yeah, that's not. I mean, you know. So I mean, but I'm saying it's not. There's not. I don't think people here. You know, I think people go to New York to see the Tony winning play. Frankly, I think it has more to do with touring shows where it will have an impact. Um, you know, it's very difficult. You know. People don't realize that the majority of the presenting houses around the country where commercial tours play, these theaters are vastly larger than Broadway houses, and these shows come into town for eight performances, and they play Tuesday through Sunday in most cases. So everything is about advanced sale. There is very limited time for reviews to have an impact, for word of mouth to have an impact. Half the run is usually over before the critic has, has voiced an opinion of that tour. So the people who present those shows, the people who market those shows, need whatever they can hold on to or hold out to audiences to say, this is going to be worth it for mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a certain amount of attention and titles become more familiar, even just by virtue of being nominated for awards. Um, and the fact of the matter is, there is only one annual television program in the country that talks about theater at all, and it happens to be the Tony Awards. Awards in any form, in any industry, always have their challenges, but the fact that the only time the mass media, the largest medium that we have that still comes in free, unless, I mean, yes, you may have cable, but you can still get CBS, that they hear about theater is that, is that program. And so there is a familiarity that can be gained. And I often say, I mean, as somebody who spent eight years intimately involved in the Tony Awards, I don't even, I never even had a problem when, as the Times would do, and many papers and, and magazines would do, and even people online, would, would write, oh, well, if they included Off-Broadway, this would be nominated. Or they'll write, you know, what the Tonys missed. Um, what it does, what awards do, is they give everybody an opportunity to revisit the season, the, you know, what, whatever it is. And even if they criticize the awards process, fairly or unfairly, it's, it's their opportunity to do so. If it causes 
everybody to take a look back. If it causes the media to look at it again, it's just a way of putting a cap. And when I talked earlier about context of seeing people's work at institutional theaters in a context, it puts kind of a theatrical season in a context, be it in New York, in Washington, you know, and that's why more and more cities, frankly, have sprung up their own awards. There's also just a desire to celebrate stuff. And while you bitch about, oh, it should have gone to so-and-so, it's inevitable people lose, overall, it's a reminder that there's, there's a lot of good stuff and it can't even all get recognized. Someone wants you to speak about the YouTube and copyright and the fact that the Tonys saw all their clips from YouTube. What does that mean? Um, it's an awfully specific question. Um, <laughs> it, it, it relates to, I mean, the, the fact of the matter is, is I think the genie's out of the bottle and it's not really appropriate for me to discuss the biz, that, that level of business of the Tonys since I no longer represent the Tony right. Awards, um, except to say that, you know, copyright, uh, I think there are broader copyright issues in the theater uh, and in, in all of the arts, which are an issue, and if you do not protect copyright, you lose ownership of it. And um, whether it's sheet music being pirated all over the internet, whether it's video footage uh, from the Tony Awards, um, I don't, I think we do run a danger, and it's true in journalism as well. If everything that's created is believed to be then free for the taking, then it will become harder and harder to create that material. Good journalism needs to be paid for. Songwriters need to earn a living. The Broadway League and the American Theatre Wing need to be able to produce the Tony Awards for the effect that I just said. And if all of that stuff is just out there for anyone, anytime to use in any way they see fit, then there will not be the funds to propagate any of those things. And, and that, you know, it goes right, you know, it's patent law, it's all of those things. There has to be, there has to be a benefit for creators to create work, or the work may never get created. We're nearing the end of our time. Are there any more uh, pertinent questions there that we should put to these guys? I promised one person I would ask this if I could get it in. What are your thoughts about giving up written reviews in favor of an online discussion instead? What are your thoughts about Never. giving up written reviews? <laughs> <laughs> Give up more space? Are you kidding? Uh, I, I think I, adding the component would be more interesting to me than, than subtracting uh, entirely um, written reviews. I think there's a, I think there still is an important um, audience for the printed word. Uh, that has not, that may I don't know what shape that's going to take in the next 15 years. You can see the the, re, the retraction, the, retr the retrenchment. But um, I'm absolutely would love the idea of some uh, central place where we all talked about reviews. Yeah, I don't think it's an either or situation. I mean, I as I said, I personally don't want to get would never want to be online debating the merits of a particular show, but some people like to do that. And there is the danger of, you know, some people not being, not doing it in the best of intentions, um, which I would not want to be party to. But I don't think it's an either or thing. I should say, this seems a good moment to mention, you know, P th this whole relationship between Peter and I sprang up truly um, spontaneously. We are talking about the fact that we're going to try to start setting a time every couple of weeks that we'll publicize so that people can get on and we'll you know, just talk about stuff. There's a very good program uh, that that the new play program here at Arena is doing. Um, it, it's um, an offshoot of their blog, HowlRound, and they do the weekly Howl at uh, Tuesdays at 3 o'clock Eastern. Um, there's great conversation there. There's usually a topic. Peter and I, I think, can approach some other things in other ways, um, and hopefully people will join in. You know, there was one question I'd seen on Twitter that, that um, since, since I don't see Chad scribbling furiously, I'll, I'll just bring it up. Somebody had asked, you know, how Twitter might actually be used in theater. And uh, I was sort of curious as to what, it, I, I, I asked this person because I'd seen it, I said, you know, do you mean by theaters 
for promotion, or do you mean in uh, the work itself? And and they, I believe, demurred and said, "Well, I'd be curious to see how you respond to it." I'm less interested in in exploring. Uh, is a marketing tool or a promotional tool because that's another whole discussion. Um, but but to respond to that, and, and I'd be curious to Peter's thoughts as well. Obviously, um, I think that Twitter will be mentioned in plays. The more we have playwrights who are growing up with it and for whom it's common language, I remember a number of years ago when I saw the play Closer, um, which relied on projected. Uh, email exchanges, and I was kind of like, oh wow, that's very modern, and very new. It hasn't become a trend in theater for it to replace things. I think one of the challenges of Twitter, I think Twitter would force playwriting into a sort of formalized exercise that might be an intriguing gimmick but not sustain, simply because its, it's whole reason for existing is that you are writing messages in 140 characters. And so you could challenge playwrights to say, do a play in which nobody ever talks in something longer than a tweet or something like that. But, but it's, it's, it's just a formalist exercise. I don't think anybody writing be it for the theater, be it for literature, anybody creating should be forced into any structure. And I think that in particular, because Twitter exists to limit, it's, it's fundamentally not going to be a new art form beyond you know, six word synopses of Shakespeare plays. Um, I'll try to keep my response to 140 characters or so. I'm just gonna say, I, I would love it if more theater professionals would go on Twitter. I wish more artistic directors, I wish people like Molly and David Muse and Michael Kahn and Michael Kaiser would, would engage. I think that I have found this incredibly wonderful community of young writers who wanna be heard um, on Twitter, I found that the infrastructure of theater, some people are still afraid of how much they could really be expected to communicate. I wish that more of that was happening. That, that's there, I think, theater. Yeah, theater, 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 theater. Thank you very much to Howard Sherman and Peter Barnes. Why is he so mad?